بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا وملائكتنا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه في الأولين وصل وسلم وبارك عليه في الآخرين وصل وسلم وبارك عليه في الملأ الأعلى إلى يوم الدين Sisters, please, while you're coming in, please come in quietly, so that we are not disturbing those who are sitting down quietly. So last week, we completed um, the discussion around the Arabian Peninsula, and we spoke about, the session before that, we spoke about the social affairs, we spoke about political affairs, and last week we spoke extensively about the religious situation within the Arabian Peninsula. Now today, we're going to begin by speaking about a question that is generally posed one uh, in this, at this kind of juncture when moving into the birth of the Prophet And the question is, why was the Arabian Peninsula chosen? And this question is important. And there are theories that are placed out there for why the Arabian Peninsula is chosen. Some theories are good, some theories are not so good. But I want us to kind of reconsider this from one angle. And that is that there is, in my humble opinion, only one reason why the Arabian Peninsula was chosen. There's one reason why the Arabian Peninsula was chosen. Anyone want to guess why? Why was the Arabian Peninsula chosen? That's good, but I want the one reason. Yes? Language, good, but there's one reason. Ah, that's interesting, but there's only one reason. Ah, good. These are all very good, and we're going to talk about each one of these right now, but there's one reason. Exactly. That is exactly why the Arabian Peninsula was chosen, because it was Allah's will. And that is the most profound reason why the Arabian Peninsula was chosen. And I want this really to be the basis for our disposition in life. That when we can come to consider anything that happens in our life, the, really the answer to the why question is one. And that is that Allah Jalla Jalal chose for that to be the case. Because we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is our creator, our sustainer, He is the absolute most wise. And there is no one wiser than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in Allah Jalla wa Ala's will and desire and decree, is the most wisest possible thing. And nothing can be wiser. So we should find comfort in the simple fact that Allah chooses to do something. As soon as you see that Allah has chosen to do something, you find comfort in that. And you instantaneously recognize that that is the best thing for you. The best thing for Islam was Allah, what Allah chose for Islam, the Arabian Peninsula. In our lives, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes away a child, that is exactly what is needed for you. That is the best thing for you. Why and the why and why not? These are questions that can be useful, but if they're situated properly. The why question can be useful, but when it's situated properly. And you see in the Quran and the Sunnah, the Prophet ﷺ teaches us when does the why question actually become useful? Prophet ﷺ was giving a khutbah one day and a man came to him and he said, Mata sa'a? When is the hour, Ya Rasulullah? What was the Prophet's reply? What did you prepare for it? The man is asking a semi-theoretical question. When is the hour? And the Prophet's instantaneous response is pragmatic and practical. What have you prepared for it? Forget about when it's coming. What have you prepared for it? In the Quran, yes, they ask you about the crescents and the moons. 
What is the response? قُلْ هِيَ قُلْ هِيَ مَوَقِيتْ لِلنَّاسِ وَالْحَجْ It is a matter of time for people to apportion their times. This is when you'll pray, this is when you do hajj, etc. No deep philosophical musings about the nature of the moon and what it can mean and so on. Practical. So for our sake, when we consider these kind of questions, the first thing is, Allahu Jalla wa Ala has chosen. Sami'na wa ata'na ya Allah. That absolutely is the most wise because the most wise chose it. After that, the considerations that you make and all of these brothers, Zahullah Khair, mentioned very good things that we're going to touch each one of those right now. But all of those are lessons to be learned. Theories that we can approach with. Possible lessons, good lessons, practical lessons. So inshallah ta'ala, I want that to be our mindset as we're approaching this subject matter. So one brother mentioned, and this was my first point, the fact that the Arabian Peninsula is strategically located between the Roman and the Persian Empire. The Roman and Persian Empire, we know, are the two superpowers of that time, and here you have the Arabian Peninsula. Now, the Arabian Peninsula, in the minds of these superpowers, is this little joke of a peninsula beneath them. It doesn't size up to them. Right? They are these grand powers, and this peninsula is meaningless. Even when the Arabians began to kind of move towards, the Romans and the Persians would laugh. What are you guys going to come with your horses and I don't know what? All right, go, come and play. Completely unexpected that any type of true power can come from that region. Now, you know, this tells you, don't doubt the little guy. You know, sometimes the little guy can come up and do big things. Allah in the Quran, what does he tell us? وَكَمْ مِنْ فِيَةٍ قَلِيلَةٍ غَلَبَتْ فِيَةً كَثِيرَةً بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ How many small people were able to become victorious over a large amount of people? بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ By the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we understand that this strategic location was very suitable that within decades, the Arabian the, the Prophet ﷺ was able to overtake through you know, the, the, the message of Islam within decades, was able to take over the Roman and the Persian Empire. Possibly if they were situated far away across seas, and these two superpowers were still existing, that would have not existed. Also, the fact that within decades, really Islam was able to conquer these great empires. And that injected into the people to those who are non-Muslim, these Muslims are really a force. And simultaneously, it gave confidence to the Muslims that look, look how quick, if Islam in its purity is followed, look at what can, can be achieved. So that's the first lesson that we can consider. The second is the idea that there were no organized systems of governance within the Arabian Peninsula. They were simply warring tribes, disparate warring tribes, without any central governance. No parliament, no president, no uh, you know, central bank, none of these things. And so the coming of the Prophet ﷺ made it that there wouldn't be any major opposition to the Prophet ﷺ bringing in a sense of organization. Whereas, imagine if he were to go to, for example, Persia or Rome, which had these very well-established governments and, and institutions. Imagine the Prophet ﷺ trying to establish something in that environment. It would be extremely difficult. Whereas in the Arabian Peninsula, it was ripe. And the room for growth was very much present. And so you see that quickly, the Prophet ﷺ is able to gather these people Right? And, and, and organize them. And there are many examples of how the Prophet ﷺ, because who he was, was able to achieve this. The most famous example that we're going to get to, inshallah, is the example of the Black Rock, when they were rebuilding the Kaaba. And the Prophet ﷺ, you know, kind of symbolically became the person who, who was able to bring them to a meaningful solution. Each one of you carry the cloth, and ultimately the Prophet ﷺ is the one who took the Black Rock and placed it in its place. That was very symbolic to the Prophet ﷺ going to organize these people and, and turn them into a well-organized institution entity. 
The next point is the power of the Arabic language. And this point is going to really be hard for me to illustrate simply because to really appreciate the Arabic language, you have to appreciate language. And this is something that is theorized, but there's a very strong argument to be made that the Arabic language is one of the most strongest languages. Especially, so you have, generally speaking, you have Semitic languages and you have European languages. European being Latin, French, Spanish, etc., English, and Semitic being Hebrew and Arabic and so on. And amongst the Semitic languages, so the Semitic languages, linguists will say, are generally much stronger than European languages. But amongst the Semitic languages, the Arabic language is truly profound, powerful. From one root, you know, from Balaba, you can transmutate dozens and dozens and dozens of words. I remember reading a chart that pointed out that the Arabic language has something like 12 million words and the next language has something like 7 million. Right, so almost double the amount of words exist. So those who have written about this, they'll say that the Arabic language is powerful in its ability to express meaning. I wanted to give you guys a taste of this. And from a Jahili poet who was Sahib Ahad al Mu'allaqat, he was the, we spoke about the Mu'allaqat that were hung, the poetry that was hung on the Kaaba. Umru al Qais was one of the Ashab al-Mu'allaqat. He wrote a Mu'allaqa that was hung on the Kaaba and people could come and read it and see it. He wanted to express the pain that was he, he was in and the depression that he was in, the sadness that he was in and what the night was doing to him. So he says, وَلَيْلٍ كَمَوْجِ الْبَحْرِ أَرْخَى سُدُولَهُ عَلَيَّ بِأَنْوَاعِ الْهُمُومِ الْيَبِتَلِي He says like a night, كَلَيْلٍ that it really over dominated me. like a wave. This wave that really dominated me. with all forms of hem, of anguish, to punish me, to test me. So I said to this wave, لما تمطى بسلبه وأردف أعجازا وناء بك الكلي. I know this word, this sounds Chinese to you, but it's beautiful. <laughs> so he says, when you have come to me, and he describes the night like a camel that is descending. So you know a camel when when you tell it to sit, it kind of has this very specific motion to it. It goes down front and then back, and then it settles. So he's, he's describing the wave like a camel that has sat on him, literally slowly, front, back, and then settles on him. فَقُلْتُ لَهُ لَمَّا تَمَطَّ بِصُلْبِهِ وَأَرْضَ فَعَجَازًا وَنَا أَبِكَ أَلَا أَيُّهَا الْلَيْلُ الطَّوِيلُ أَلَنْجَلِي Oh, you long night, go away. بِصُبْحٍ Go away and be replaced by a morning. And not even the morning is good. <laughs> you know, night, day, everything is depressing to him. This is just a taste. Now this is a Jahi Arab. And his ability to express meaning through the Arabic language is profound. And the Arabs, the one thing that they really had, if you can, they, they had things, but the fact that their Arabic was so pure that until today, if we want to reference the root of a word, whether a, a word is truly Arabic or not, or it's in use, we go to Jahili poetry. We go to that period of poetry to learn pure Arabic. All right, so that's one thing to consider uh, in this regard. The next, and this is an extremely important point in my opinion, is that there were no clearly philosophical orientations that existed in the Arabian Peninsula. What do I mean by this? If you look at Persia, and you look at Rome, and you look at the East, all of the, and you look at Egypt, you look at the Syrian region which encompassed Palestine, everything. You look at Yemen, which was right to the south. All of them were influenced by some philosophical disposition. 
So in Rome, you had people like Socrates and Aristotle and Plato who had developed very intricate systems of thought and consideration for how to perceive life, the nature of things, the nature of God, etc. So there was a lot of philosophical baggage in Rome and Persia. In the East, you had people like Confucius that already began to develop for their people. These were their, I mean, the people, they looked at these people as their wise men. And so these places, they had civilizations rich in culture, rich in, 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 in philosophy, rich in these kind of things, which the Arabian Peninsula did not have. And so you can say that the Arabian Peninsula was kind of pure in that sense. Now, keep in mind everything that I said, we spoke about the social and the religious and all of those factors, but there was a purity to them. There was no philosophical baggage that would hinder them. And so when the Quran and Sunnah came, the Quran and Sunnah really had ripe ground to flourish. Right? It, it, the Quran and uh, the Prophet did not have to compete with Aristotle. He didn't have to compete with Confucius. He didn't have to compete with all of these thought processes. The Arabs were these simple people, and I use simple very carefully, simple people who were engaged in some mindless activity that were easily organized. And the Quran and Sunnah can be introduced to them. Now the point that I really want to emphasize here is that, yes, the Prophet taught them that the Quran and Sunnah is your primary source of knowledge. The, prime, the Quran and Sunnah is the way in which you perceive and understand and you live life. That is your primary filter. So much so that early on when Sayyidina Umar was holding the Torah from Sayyidina Musa, what did the Prophet tell him? He said, leave the Torah, leave it. If Sayyidina Musa was here, he would be following me and he would be reading the Quran. Now, this does not mean, and I want us to be very careful about this, this does not mean that we do not benefit from others. No, of course. Al-hikmatu dalatul mu'min. Wisdom is the guide of the believer. Wherever you find wisdom, you follow it. But as Muslims, the absolute guidance and absolute wisdom is found in the Quran and Sunnah. And the heritage of Islamic knowledge that we've inherited. That's our primary source of knowledge. And every single thing else is secondary. And everything is filtered through that. And the Prophet ﷺ himself, it's not as if he erased everything that he had come to know. The Prophet ﷺ, when he speaks about why he was sent, he said, وَمَا بُعِفْتُ إِلَّا لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ He came to perfect the, exist, the, the best of existing character. So he saw that there were good things, but he, through him, the Quran and Sunnah and so on, laid the, the groundwork for what should be learned, and how it should be learned, and how Islam establishes principles and values and meanings. He even took, he would even take some of the principles that existed and he would quote unquote Islamize it. For example, the Arab, the Arab, they had this thing where they would say, Umsur akhara zaliman al mafluman. Bring victory to your brother, whether they are an oppressor or they are oppressed. Now, either way, your brother is your brother. Bring victory to them. The Prophet ﷺ said the same thing. He took it and he adopted it. He said, Umsur akhaka zaliman al mafluman. So, subhanAllah, the companions had already been inculcated. Right? They would already developed an understanding for the Qur'an and Sunnah. And so they said, Ya Rasulullah, okay, we understand how to bring victory to our brothers if they are oppressed. But how do I bring victory to my brother if he is an oppressor? The Prophet ﷺ says, you bring victory to your brother who is an oppressor by preventing him from committing oppression. The Prophet ﷺ took a value that existed and Islamized it. The concluding point in this regard is our primary source of knowledge is the Qur'an and Sunnah and the Islamic heritage that we've inherited. And wallahi, brothers and sisters, it's rich. Just because we do not really know how rich it is doesn't mean it's not powerful. We are the ones who are lacking in our ability to really understand what we have and what we've inherited from our forefathers. And wallahi, it is profound. Take it from me. 
I can explain to you, maybe it'll take me 10 years. But wallahi, it is profound and powerful. And before we decide that we need to replace parts of our Islam, or we need to introduce outside thinkers for them to define for us what we believe in, make sure you know what you have first. And I'll leave it at that, inshallah. The next point is the fact that the Kaaba was in the Arabian Peninsula. And the Kaaba, we know, is built by... We have the predecessors of Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail. And Ibrahim alayhi salam is who? He is Abu al-Anbiya. He is the father of prophets. And so there is kind of this befitting quality that the house أول بيت وضع للناس للناس is ألف ألف لام للجنس all of people ألف لام الناس للجنس all of people this is the the house that is placed for all of people and so it's befitting that the first prophet who's a universal prophet كافة للناس the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم بشيرا ونذيرا that it is Mecca that is honored with that space. This is something that is beautiful to be considered because you have this larger historical trajectory of Tawheed that is now being embraced and almost quote unquote finalized by the Prophet. The next very interesting point is the fact that the Arabs, and this I think is very crucial. The fact that the Arabs were never people who were ruled over. The Arabs were always free people. They were never colonized. They never had a power that colonized them or controlled them. Think about it. They were free. For all intents and purposes, they were free people. It's not as if the Persians had controlled them for a period of time, so they were you know, influenced or they were kind of in submission to this power. And their freedom kind of gave them this, this confidence, this power, this ability to go forward and be brave. There is a lot in that freedom that enabled them to embrace the message of Islam. And we mentioned this briefly last time, the significance of freeing your mind to embrace righteousness and good. And we said that the way in which you free your mind is by submitting to the Creator. There is no other way for you to free yourself from the shackles of people and things and places and powers other than submitting to the most powerful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, to kind of make this come closer, I mean, I lived in Egypt for almost seven, eight years. And it would shock me that I would go into these restaurants and I would see, you know, Route 66 posters on the wall and, you know, country music playing, you know. <laughs> what exactly do Egyptians know about Route 66 <laughs> or country music? What does that have to do with them? Now, the Egyptians were a colonized people, but until today, in many ways, whether it's in the Middle East, or in the subcontinent, many aspects of the world are still colonized, but they're culturally colonized. Yeah, they may not be ruled by an outside party, you know, there's some theorizing there, but culturally, many people still are very much colonized, and they still are obsessed with the other, and they have not been able to embrace themselves. Now, I'm not making a general rule about all of Egyptians or all of Arabs or all of Pakistanis or all of, no, no. But this is something that is definitely recognizable if you go to the Middle East and, uh, and the subcontinent and so on. So for us, we have to be very careful. Be very aware of what you believe in. Be very aware of what motivates you. That's what enables us to really embrace the goodness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the guidance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That we're mindful of what we believe in. What really motivates me? How do I think? Why do I think the way I think? Why do I like this thing and not that thing? Why is it that I find it, for example, um, that marrying a cousin is so disgusting? 
But in other cultures, it happens all the time. I'm not encouraging or discouraging. I'm just painting a picture that there is a process that they call habituation, that through habit and through experience, we begin to adopt understandings and meanings, and they become what motivate us. And so for our sake, we want the primary motivator to be Allah Jalla and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, you know, just to kind of really illustrate this point of when something, how powerful external forces can affect you. And we mentioned this in, in past times about the power of the hawa, the desire and sin to really affect who you are and what you are and what you can learn and how you can grow and how you can free yourself. Imam Shafi'i one time, he was complaining about his ability to memorize. And so he went to one of his teachers by the name of Waqiya. So he says, I complained to Waqiya the fact that my memorization had become weakened. Now he was a person that literally he would cover one page so that his eyes don't fall on it because if it fell on it, he would memorize it. That's how powerful his memorization skills were. And so he would have to cover it. But he found that his weakening, that, that his memorization was weakening. So he says, شَكَوْتُ إِلَىٰ وَكِيعٍ سُوَحِرْضِي فَأَرْشَدَنِي إِلَىٰ تَرْكِ الْمَعَاصِي And so he guided me to تَرْكِ الْمَعَاصِي Leave sin. And he says, فَإِنَّ الْعِلْمَ نُورِ That verily knowledge is nur light. فَإِنَّ الْعِلْمَ نُورِ وَنُورُ اللَّهِ لَا يُهْدَى لِعَاصِي And the light of Allah is not given to us here. You know what Imam Shafi had, you know what his major sin was? He saw the ankle of a woman. It's not like he was, he saw it. And that had led to his weakening of memorization. So think about the amount of guidance and nur from Allah that we prevent ourselves by engaging in sin, by fulfilling our desires, by following our whims. How much nur and guidance is prevented from us in this regard? So we have to be very mindful of this, inshallah, as we proceed. And all of this, really, I want us to keep this in mind as we're preparing to take in the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he is the nur, he is the source of light for us. He is our guide. He is our ultimate source of salvation. And so we go to him looking for guidance. And so we should prepare ourselves mentally and spiritually, psychologically to receive the guidance of the Prophet The next point, and this is also important, is the fact that the Arabs lived in a very harsh climate. And this hard, you know, arid desert, constantly struggling for water, constantly struggling for sustenance, it wasn't easy. And so they lived regularly very difficult lives. So there, that was a constant in their life. So when they were now responsible through the guide of the Prophet wasallam to go out into expeditions and to really grow this religion into the magnificent thing that it became, it required men men with a capital M, not men with a lowercase m, men and women with a capital W. That's what was required. And these Arabs, they were men and women. They were strong people. They could handle a lot. They weren't weak and flimsy. One of the famous stories of the Sukut of Al-Andalus, when, when um, Al-Andalus was falling, Spain, Islamic Spain, the last kind of moment that is recorded is when the last ruler over Al Andalus was leaving and he had his mother with him and he looked back and he was crying. And so his mother yells at him and she says, Don't cry like a girl over something that you did not protect like a man. Now you're crying like a girl over something you did not protect like a man. And so what does this mean for us? The Prophet ﷺ says, إِخْشَوْشَنُوا فَإِنَّ النِّعْمَةَ لَا تَدُونَ إِخْشَوْشَنُوا comes from, from khashim, 
from something that is harsh and rough. Don't find yourself obsessing over comfort and ease. This idea that we always have to be comfortable, that things always have to be easy, it's a delusion. It's deceptive. The Prophet ﷺ never allowed himself to find himself constantly in ease. Actually, quite the contrary. He would not set it up that ease was his constant. So his mat was clear, one flat mat that he slept on on the floor, that it would create imprints in his face. And so Sayyidina Umar, the famous story, he comes and he sees this, and it's hard for him to see that the Prophet is sleeping like this, and he says, you know, these qayasara, they sleep in this way, and you're sleeping like this, Ya Rasulullah. And it bothers him. Rasulullah says, no, this is, this is how the Prophet of Allah sleeps. One of his wives, one day, she just, just folded it over once, and the Prophet overslept a little bit, and he became very angry. Khshawshin. I'm not saying everyone should go sell their beds and sell their homes and go sleep on the floor in the woods. But we need to, as a people, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, we have to stop obsessing over this the idea that everything is supposed to be comfortable and everything's supposed to be easy. That's not supposed to be the case. We should actively live within our means and understand that the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala la tadum is not constant. And that verily we will be asked about these ni'mah. Remember I mentioned this when the Prophet turned to Abu Bakr and Umar after they had been starving for days and they finally got a piece of meat, the Prophet stopped them and said, see this ni'mah that you're eating from? You will absolutely be questioned about this ni'mah. This is the ni'mah that you will be questioned. Allah has blessed us with many ni'am, many comforts, many things. All of these things that we have, everything, this home, this house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we've been given, clothing, cars, comforts, home, homes, food, Dunkin' Donuts, all of it, we will be asked about. And so we have to be very mindful that we don't become indulgent in these things, that these things don't define who I am. Because just like that person, that, you know, Amir of Spain, who had been engaging in all forms of luxury and comfort, the Sukut of Spain is very important to read and study. Maybe we'll do it sometime. But you see that one of the main reasons why Spain fell was because of their indulgences. And their enamor they were, became enamored with luxury and comfort and the high life and the nice life, the, rich, the life of the rich and famous that car in this place and that place and I want this and build these beautiful things. And that ultimately led to their demise. So I think not just for ourselves but for our children as well that we teach them it's not all about comfort and ease. It's not all about relaxation. The next point and this is the final point before we move on to the next section is the fact that the Prophet was sent to an unlettered people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, Huwa alladhi ba'atha fil ummiyina rasoola min anfusi. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to these ummiyin, these unlettered people, a rasool, a messenger from themselves. And so the Prophet being an unlettered messenger, does not read, read or write, excuse me. And the Arabs being an unlettered people, and the one thing that the Arabs had that I said earlier was what? What did they have a strong command over? And language, correct? Unlettered. Now they learned, their Arabic was not learned through books. It was all inherited. This is all that they knew. They knew to speak Arabic perfectly. They didn't know anything else. And so when the Prophet ﷺ, who was also unlettered, and who was not known for these kind, for, for poetry or any of this kind of things. He was not a sha'ir. And suddenly he comes with this Qur'an that is so profound in the Arabic language, it just completely overwhelms them. And we said the story of Surah Al-Najm, when they heard Surah Al-Najm, that they couldn't but at the end be amazed by what the Prophet was saying and they fell into submission. They fell into sujood because of what they heard about the Arabic language. 
And so there is great virtue, number one, in understanding that the Prophet ﷺ was sent to these unlettered people, and he himself was unlettered, and this was key in the influence he was able to have over them. But also, this word that Allah says, and we see this recurring in all the stories of the Prophets, min anfusihim, from his own people, that the messengers are from his people. Right? The Prophet was not alien to the Arabs. He was not something that was odd for them to see or hear. He was one of them. And so you can't deny someone who is one of yourself. Like you can't deny the Prophet ﷺ, this is Muhammad, we know him. This is a trustworthy, we can't deny him. Plus, you know, he's this lineage that he has and these grandfathers and this Quraysh and everything. Now, this becomes relevant and important for us to understand that as Muslims, as Muslims, we live in America. And we are Americans. There is no doubt about that. Anyone who wants to tell you you're not American, tell them, Ma'asalam, I'm an American. Now, I don't say that for any, you know, oh, great to be an American, or no, it's bad to be an No, I'm, not, I'm just saying... American. I, I was born and raised in America. All right? My father came to America in the 60s. Now, we are from this land. And we are from these people. And our disposition towards teaching others is one of, these are my people that I care about. And these are my people that I want to deliver the message of Islam to. Min anfusihim. I want us to be very mindful of this. That the way in which I treat my people, and yes, I believe our people, is that we want to teach them the message of Islam. We want to teach them the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so we have to be mindful of this. Put out of your mind that those are those people and, and we are this or we are closed in here for whatever reason, that I insulate myself out of fear, out of intimidation, out of this or that, but rather, no. I'm an American and I have the right to believe in what I believe in. You are absolutely protected as a Muslim by the Constitution to believe in what you believe in. And the Constitution, oddly enough, or interestingly enough, especially the Second Amendment, was specifically written to prote protect odd belief systems. Early on, you had these Catholics and others, Protestants, so on and so forth, all these different Christian denominations which were being persecuted. And so the, this amendment was written to, protect, written to protect religious freedom, that you can believe in your odd belief. Fine, Islam is an odd belief, uh, fine, it's an odd belief, but this is what I believe in, and this is the absolute truth for me, and I will hold on to it. I will not shy away from it, and I will teach it, as an American. And what an American is, is a work in progress. No one can claim absolute Americanness. You know, I hear this all the time, I remember watching this clip and this guy saying, well, you know, some of you Muslims, you, you look American and some of you don't. What is it, what, what does an American look like exactly? That's what I'm interested in. This is something that we have to be aware of. There is no absolute definition for American. A hundred years ago, an American looked some way and sounded some way, very different from what an American looks today. In maybe a hundred years, it looked very different. And we are a part of the process of making America, America. And the greatest contribution that we can make to this land that we are a part of and that we are from is to give them the Quran and the Sunnah. This is the greatest contribution that we can give. And I want us to be very mindful and forward about this. Not retreating and, and uneasy and kind of just feeling intimidated and under pressure, but rather, no, I have something very powerful, the Quran and Sunnah. And I want to introduce this to define for what an American looks like. If Americans are many things, one of the things that Americans are are this thing. And here, I'm a Muslim. Proud of my hijab, proud of my look, Proud of my speech, proud of my names, proud of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That there is no concept I'm going to change my name for anybody. For what reason? Muhammad is an American. Muhammad is an American name. 
All right, put it down next to John. There is no such thing as turning it into Mo or Mike or any of those considerations. So I want us to be, inshallah, very mindful of this as we are proceeding in our pursuit of learning from the Prophet sallallahu and exemplifying who and what the Prophet sallallahu was. Good so far? So now we're coming to the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And there are three events that we have to be mindful of and these events are necessary precursors to the coming of the Prophet I don't know if we're going to get to all of them today because it's already 9.07. But we'll get through the first one and we'll see if we have time to get into the next two. But these events are very important because they kind of, they're introducing the coming of the Prophet So when it comes to, excuse me, when it comes to Zamzam, <coughs> when it comes to Zamzam, we know that Zamzam broke when? When did Zamzam break? When did Zamzam spring forth? During the time of Ismail and Hajar. So the spring of Zamzam comes forth, and we said that a tribe from Yemen by the name of Jurhum comes north and comes to settle with them. And they make an agreement and ultimately they settle. What we learn is that as time progresses, there Problems begin to happen, and ultimately the tribe of Jurhum decides to cover and bury Zamzam, along with swords and golden statues, golden things, and so on and so forth. And for, for a large part, Zamzam becomes lost and forgotten. It was known to the people, kind of like in this legendary sense that we have, we know of this never-ending source of water, Zamzam, that happened miraculously through Ismail. So people know of this, but they have no idea where it is. Until this period, right before the birth of the Prophet Abdul Muttalib, who is the grandfather of the Prophet and who at that point is a respected member of the Qurayshi society, his father, Hashim, was someone who was responsible for the Hujjaj, for feeding them and giving them drink. Abdul Muttalib is recognized. And he's respected, but he's not that well regarded. But he's regarded. And so he's sleeping by the Kaaba. Not in Hijr Ismail alayhi salam. He's sleeping in the Hijr of Sayyidina Ismail. And as he's sleeping, he has a dream. Someone comes to him in a dream and says, Uhfur Taiba. Dig up Taiba. Taiba comes from the word Taib, goodness. Uhfur Taiba. Dig up Taiba. And so he says, What is Taiba? And whoever came to him in the dream goes away. The next night, same dream occurs. And he asks, What is Taiba? Where is Taiba? The person or the thing, whoever goes away. Third night, same way. The fourth night, Whoever came to him in the dream said, Uhfur Zamzam, dig up Zamzam. And he gives Abdul Muttalib the exact coordinates of Zamzam. He says, it is Andawad al Naml, where the birds come and eat. And he gives them these very elaborate, exact coordinates. And the, the whole riwayah is found in Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Isha. So he wakes up, and at that point he has one son. Abdul Muttalib had ten sons and six daughters. He has one son, his oldest son, Al-Hashim. And so he takes Al-Hashim and he brings an axe and he begins to dig and dig at this exact coordinate until Zamzam breaks once again, miraculously. He was given this dream and this event of the coming of Zamzam happens once again. And so he says, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. That's what he says. And the people come the other Arab tribes, and they see what Abdul Muttalib has found, what he's, what he's standing on top of. Instantaneously, what do they say? We have rights to this as a well. This is the well of Ismail. This is not just your well. We want it as well. We want to claim rights as well. It's not just yours. So Abdul Muttalib says, no, I was you know, given the dream. <laughs> and I am responsible for it. I am the one who is to be the sole person responsible for this well. They're not happy and they're not having it. So they tell Abdul Muttalib, no. 
we need to figure out a way to resolve this issue. Abd al-Muttalib is a very reasonable, wise man. So he says, okay, go ahead. What do you guys suggest? They'll say, we will we'll, we'll go to Kahinat Banu Sa'd. The Kahina, the soothsayer or the sorcerer of Banu Sa'd, who is in Syria, so very far north. But that's where we're going to go to, and she is the one who will settle this dispute between us. Abdul Muttalib said, fine. So all of these tribes, they gather their belongings, just the heads and so on, major players, and they go towards uh, Syria. Now, the desert between there and Syria is very harsh, very difficult terrain, very difficult desert. And the water that they have is minimal. And so as they're progressing, the water that they had runs out. And so they're camped out, and things are clearly becoming very difficult. The water has run out, and they know, Abdul Muttalib senses, that we're not going to make it out of this. We're not going to make it to Syria comfortably. So he suggests, now Abdul Muttalib, there's a sense of honor to him. There's honor to him and dignity. And he says, we're not going to die out kind of thirsty in the middle of the desert. I suggest that each of us dig our own grave and lay in it. Because I don't want that the hyenas, the siba, the hyenas would come and eat us. You know, falcons or birds or whatever to come and nip at our bodies. No, we are people. As one of us dies, we'll just, the others will come and cover us. So they take counsel and the people agree. The next day, as they're all sitting in their graves that they have dug up, Abdul Muttalib gets this inspiration, this motivation, and he says, we can't just lay here. We can't just lay here and die. We have to get up and we have to look for water. That is the most dignified thing to do at this point. So they all agree. And as Abdul Muttalib is getting on his camel, and his camel is you know, doing that rocking motion to get up, his camel stomps on the ground and water springs forth. And the Arabs are ecstatic, the tribes are ecstatic, everyone's happy, Abdul Muttalib is happy, everyone starts drinking, everyone starts filling up their, their, their satchels, whatever they had. And so the people said to Abdul Muttalib, clearly, you are the one who has been chosen for this message. Right? You know, clearly you're the one who's, who's to be given the Zamzam. We don't need to go to the Kahina of Banu Zad anymore. Allah has resolved this issue for us. And you have, whoever gave you, subhanAllah, look at the words, that whoever gave you this water is the one who gave you Zamzam. And so he goes back to Mecca and he continues to dig up Zamzam and he extracts all of these precious metals, the uh, I'm sorry, the gold and the swords and everything. And the portion that he had, he took and he melted it, and he turned it into the door of the Kaaba. That was the giving of Abdul Muttalib. So what are some of the takeaways from this? Number one, this really heightened the status of Abdul Muttalib amongst his people. Abdul Muttalib was a recognized person. But now, Abdul Muttalib just kicked it up another notch. You know, he became very, <laughs> he became very recognized amongst his people, very much honored amongst his people. And they began to really give deference to Abdul Muttalib. And the Prophet ﷺ is ultimately the grandson of Abdul Muttalib. So he is a part of this lineage. That Allah at this point, before the coming of the Prophet, is starting to introduce or reintroduce divine presence and divine intervention. That this event of the recurrence of the recoming of Zamzam is really the first time that Allah chooses to reintroduce divinity into this time period, if you will. And so they see this, and the Arabs see this, they see divine intervention happening. Someone clearly came and inspired Abdul Muttalib to dig up Zamzam. Abdul Muttalib didn't do this by his own intelligence. Someone inspired him to do that. So this was like kind of a soft introduction of Tawheed into the region. There's one final lesson, and I think we'll close with this because we're almost an hour in. And we'll talk about the next two events later, inshallah. We'll stop for questions and answers. The last lesson, and this is kind of my own theorizing, 
is the destructive nature of envy. And I know this doesn't jump out, but this is something that I kind of thought about. The Arabs initially, when they first heard from Abdul Muttalib, or they first saw that Abdul Muttalib had you know, dug up Zamzam, their initial reaction was what? Was envy. It was, how come you and not me? That was their first reaction. It wasn't, Alhamdulillah, this is a great blessing from Allah, this is a great blessing from whoever, that we've been given this, that we have this now, that this is going to be a source of water for us, this is such a blessing for our region, there's so many goods that are going to come about, none of that, no, 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 no. I have rights to this, just like you have rights to this. And this envy, what did it almost lead to? What did it almost lead to? It almost led to their death and destruction in the desert. Because they were envious, it almost led to their death and destruction in the deserts towards Syria. SubhanAllah, look how dangerous envy is. And this is what the Prophet says, that the da, the da of the umam, da al umam, that the disease of nations and people is what? Al-hasad and baghda. Envy and baghda. Hatred, blind, arrogant hatred. These are the two entities that really will destroy a people. And so we have to be very mindful that when we are envious of others, because it is definitely a destructive quality, it eats the person from the inside. But one of the greatest evils of envy is that an envious person is someone who is rejecting the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah jalla wa ala, in His wisdom, that we've already established Allah is the most absolute, most wise, that Allah has chosen, and that when Allah chooses, our disposition is, Alhamdulillah, sami'na wa ata'na. That is the decree of Allah. Allah gives someone a lot of money in a big home, decree of Allah. Allah gives me a little, the decree of Allah. Kullu khair. Everything is good and everything is equal. The Prophet teaches us, Man asbaha aminan fi sirbihi, indahu khuta yawmihi, mu'afan fi badanihi, faka'annama hizat lahu dunya bihada firiha. That anyone who wakes up in the morning healthy, safe in their home, and has food for one day, it's as, been, as if they've been given the entire world. You've been given the entire world if you have those three things. So there's nothing to be envious about. You have everything. Someone has a million, someone has 10,000, they're equal. Trust me, they're absolutely equal. They may be able to do different things, but there is no inherent value in having something. Just because Abdul Muttalib was given something, this was the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but for my sake, how is my reaction meaningful? My reaction is not meaningful when I go and try to take what Abdul Muttalib has. That's not a meaningful reaction. My reaction to the decree of Allah is not meaningful when I go and I see, hold on, how come this person has been given you know, this title? I want that title. I'm going to go and take that title. And you know what? If that person didn't have that title, you'd be fine. But it's the problem that someone else has it. I'm more deserving. How come this person got married and not me? How come this person has all these kids and I don't have any children? That disease that is an affliction for human beings, something that we need to purge ourselves of. And the first thing is that we recognize that the choice of what you have is in the hands of Allah. And as soon as you recognize that, you find absolute comfort. Wallahi al-Azim, it is so freeing. I can't emphasize how powerfully freeing it is when you realize that you are in the hands of Allah. You don't have to stress anymore. You don't have to worry anymore. Allah is the one who's taking care of things. All you have to do is complete and fulfill your duties towards Allah. And Allah will take care of the rest. He will take care of the barakah that is put in your life, your children, your health, your wealth. Allah takes care of all of those things. It's not, it's not in our hands. We don't know what's going to come about. So we see from the story of Zamzam that this quality is so destructive that it almost led to their ultimate demise. So we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the disease of envy. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who are submissive to Him and no one else. 
We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who seek His rida, His contentment, and His acceptance, and no one else's. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide our hearts to what is righteous. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us beneficial knowledge. And beneficial knowledge is knowledge that takes you towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the knowledge that we seek to have. So we beg and we ask Allah azza wa jal to grant us beneficial knowledge. And we seek refuge in Allah jalla wa ala from knowledge that does not benefit. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon us. We ask Allah jalla wa ala to guide our hearts towards Him, to make us of those who love to follow the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Allah, we recognize and we know that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is al-Hadi, is al-Mahdi. He is the one who is al-Bashir, al-Nadhir, al-Siraj, al-Munir. He is this great source of light. He is this guide. He is the one who will intercede for us on the Day of Judgment. Ya Allah, make us love Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Make us of those who love to follow in his footsteps to be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the afterlife. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put blessings in our gatherings. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this gathering a blessed gathering that is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is encompassed by the malaika, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is remembering us fi man inda, that Allah azza wa jal is remembering us right now in his mala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those, and may Allah make us of those who love to come to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to spend time in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to make us of those who love to be in the home of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma alliq qulubana bil iman wa karrih ilayna al kufra wal fusuqa wal isyan. Connect our hearts to iman and Islam and make hated to our hearts kufr and fusuq and caprice and evil and disbelief. Ya Allah, Ya Kareem, wa salli Allahumma ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in wa zayyum. Sound like before anybody gets up, I'm actually going to ask you to consider the Q&A session part of the session. And so as a respect, I ask you not to get up unless you absolutely have to, um, just to maintain a certain amount of quorum. So we'll have about five minutes or seven minutes maximum for Q&A. I think tell us you bear with us for those seven minutes. Does anybody have any questions? We have a microphone or two going around. Sisterhood has it in the back for the sisters. Almud has it for the brothers right here. And if you want to write it, write it. And you can write it down if you'd like to write it, if you don't want to speak on the microphone, which is OK. Okay. Guess he covered everything. <laughs> All right. Okay, I have a question. Uh, a lot of the questions that we face these days is that people uh, accuse that religions in general are only flourishing in now. Societies that are undeveloped or uncivilized. And from what you said, that that was a condition of Islam flourishing in the first place. So how can we encounter that? So Islam flourished in a society that had a peninsula when Rome and Persia was super civilized. No, I didn't say it was a condition. It was, this is something that we can consider. But, now no, there's a difference between, Islam has already been established. Islam has already come into existence. Islam has already grown. The Muslims lost. The Muslims turned their back. Don't think that the Muslims of this world today are not strong. The Muslims of this world today have a lot of resources. They can do a lot. There's a lot of wealth in the one point whatever billion Muslims that exist in the world. There is no such thing as the Muslims cannot thrive. The Muslims have thrived. The Muslims were at the pinnacle of history in many different times. The Muslims achieved some of the greatest things that this world has ever seen. And so the state that we are in today is not for anything but our own doing. And Islam can absolutely thrive. And no, don't necessarily think that what we have today is the pinnacle of civilization. That's one of the delusions of modern people, is that we think that we have, what we have come to as a people today is the pinnacle of greatness. What we have today, Amer the world today has reached its epitome. It's, great, it's the greatest point. No, absolutely not. The modern world is a work in progress. There are definitely civilizations in the past who thought that they had reached the pinnacle and they fell on their face the next day. So we shouldn't be deluded or arrogant to think that what we have today is the greatest, and that those other people are back there, over there, here, that are backwards, no. So can Islam flourish? Absolutely. And it can flourish 10 times out of 10. But we have to be Muslims for Islam. And Allah Jalla wa will preserve his deen. 
but for us to be a part of the process of Islam flourishing because Islam will be preserved. This is one thing to understand. But Muslims are not necessarily going to be preserved. Islam will be preserved. Muslims may not. And so our hope is that we are preserved with the preservation of Islam. As Allah preserves Islam, that we are preserved alongside, inshaAllah. And this requires that we fulfill our duties and our responsibilities towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, go ahead. Um, so we spoke a little bit before about harboring envy in our own hearts. I'm wondering if you can touch a bit upon um, methods that you can take to protect yourself from being the target of envy outside of um, reciting Surah al Salah, of course, for protection. And then secondly, in, in noticing that others may be having envy for other people, then what kinds of risk you have can you? Uh, the sisters asked, oh, everyone heard that, right? Okay. So I think it's more the answer. Um, she, the idea of how do we protect ourselves from envy. Now, there are the prescribed suwar, and prime amongst them are the mu'awadhatin, right? And they are very powerful and they suffice. But also understand that. Once you connect yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no force that could affect you. So first and foremost, connect yourself to Allah and downplay the power of other than Allah. Because all too often in this, this the, nat the supernatural realm of envy and magic and all of these things, we give a disproportionate, disproportionate about, to, excuse me, of power to other than Allah. And we become almost obsessed and fearful of this notion of hasad. And, this, and we become kind of you know, obsessed by this concept. No, free yourself of that obsession. Fulfill your responsibilities. The Prophet advises that you read the Mu'awadhatin. Do it. Read it. And submit yourself to Allah. And seek the protection of Allah Azza wa Jal. And make the ad'iyah that emphasize that you are in the protection of Allah. And that you seek refuge only in Him from hasad and from evil and from the shaitan and from the nafs and from the ayn of others. So that's point number one that should be established. The second thing is that one of the traits of our society is boastfulness. And boastfulness breeds envy. You know, I'll, I'll be honest. And I, and I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't mean to like, you know, mock or hit or hurt or... But Facebook, Facebook is, it's good in, in doses. But the idea that we keep on posting our lives out there for people to see. And we almost at times manufacture our lives for people to see. Look how happy I am. Look how beautiful I am. I take the picture that makes me, you know, just perfect. And then I put it as my profile pic. And I'm not, com I'm not happy with a hundred of my pictures, but I choose the one that makes me look good. In my mind, it makes me look good. Why is, this, why is that happening? And when we're so boastful about ourselves and we put ourselves out there for people and people see my happy life, my happy wife, and my kids, and my nice car, and all these nice things and everything's hurrah and happy and great all the time and someone who's sitting there, oh, I wish I had that. Hmm. Look how happy they look. Isn't that destructive? Is that fair to people? Is that fair to society? Where we at times almost manufacture a sense of happiness and joy, and greatness and perfection for others, just so we can boast and show to others? And this will definitely breed envy. So we have to downplay ourselves. Let's not always speak about what we have and what we've been given. And if we are going to speak about what we have or what we've been given, this al-tahdith bin ni'mah, that when you speak about your ni'mah, you only speak about it with a purpose in mind. That maybe you want to encourage others to give. If you're going to say that you've done something or that you have something, you're only speaking about it from a perspective that Alhamdulillah Allah has given me, that I recognize the blessing of Allah upon me, or that I want to encourage others to do good. But other than that, the idea of just boasting for the sake of boasting breeds a tremendous amount of evil. So first and foremost, 
do the ad'iyya and the afkar that are necessary, and secondarily, downplay yourself. And let's not upplay our lives, and we know, we all know what we do, and when we do it, and how we do it, with our family and friends, and so on. Uh,